Let's go for that. We're recording now. And uh, right now we, we wanted to well, welcome you to this virtual gathering. It's, it's a very special one for us. And before we get to the good part, I just wanted to give you a very brief introduction of Blockchain for Humanity, because we do realize there are new members here today, which excites me very much. Just want to give you a five minute uh, spiel of what Blockchain for Humanity is and why we exist and why we're here. So, um, can you see this iPhone? Ah, here. So, uh, in a very informal way, what we are is a bunch of people who wanted to make technology work for good. And it was a very simple idea. And then um, we got together, we decided we were going to create something that will show the world that social impact can be addressed with emerging technologies. In a more formal way, we're a uh, not-for-profit foundation. We, um, we pretty much work with blockchain and we want to make sure that blockchain is the one that we put to the service of humanity. On that note as well, we are operating uh, with, uh, we're covering our operating costs with uh, donations, which we receive in cryptocurrency. So we are definitely unbanked. We do not take any type of fiat money and we do walk the talk. So we do believe in cryptocurrency. I just want to say how we do this and what is the impact that we're bringing. So we kind of look at it into three ways, which we feel are the, the, the ones that bring the most impact overall. Social innovation is the first one. And that really works uh, with uh, working very closely with social entrepreneurs. We do this through the awards, uh, sort of an incubation period that we have with uh, the startups or the awardees, and uh, in which we will do some mentoring and accelerating their, their, their ideas. We have this, um, this part of the social innovation is really the core of our, of our existence. This is how we became Blockchain for Humanity. The other two legs are something that we have um, eventually looked into bringing uh, along with uh, creating more impact. And that's tech adoption, and that is specifically for non-for-profit uh, foundations or, or NGOs specifically. And that is to help them bridge the gap between where they are and where they could be with blockchain uh, technology. And that goes along with training and education and looking at ways in which we can make them more effective by bringing blockchain technology. And the last one, it's uh, my favorite one, and this is a, an ambitious goal, but we believe that we can make the blockchain space a role model for the tech industry and saying that these are the, this is the space where the business that belong to this space are very much purpose driven. And for, to that effect, we want to work very closely with the conscious leaders of these businesses to create ways in which they can support this, um, this social innovation and go beyond just profits, but bring something back to society. And the best way to do it is starting here with the social, um, with the social impact uh, focus. And then why are we here? And I just want to say that since we started with, um, with the pandemic and the crisis and the whole uh, quarantine, we believe that this is uh, social engagement is very important. And we decided immediately to start creating these virtual gatherings that allows us to share some of the challenges, uh, maybe start creating some ideas and using this uh, to, you know, adversity as an advantage to start talking about social innovations idea around this. And we look at it as the seed of opportunities. When we talk about seeds of opportunities, we really talk about reframing the world. And that is educating uh, users uh, using technologies, using new technologies or looking at alternative ways to respond to the crisis or overall, but more so, and this is probably what's linked to the, uh, to the virtual gathering today, is re rethinking the traditional structures of power and giving people more power. And that takes us then to the feature project today. We would like to introduce Will, Caroline and Ruth, which are members of uh, Grassroots Economics. 
and they're working on a project called Community Inclusion Currencies. They're going to talk about their experience implementing this and give us the opportunity to ask questions. And for us, specifically for Blockchain for Humanity, it's extremely important to have them here because we are absolutely certain that this is the way we can help communities prosper and we want to go in that direction. So we're taking the lead and implementing such system and such uh, in, uh, incentive and initiative into South America, where we want to create uh, a project just like the ones that we're going to hear about in Kenya. So with that, oops, oops, I think that's it. So I'll stop sharing the screen. Or do you have um, anything to share on your screen, Will? You're muted. I'll mute. Okay. Yeah. There no. you. Okay. You Can you guys hear me? We hear you. Loud well, and clear. Great. So I, I think uh, so. I'm I'm Will Ruddick. Um, we're based here in Kilifi, um, about an hour north of Mombasa on the coast of Kenya. Um, we've got Ruth and Zhao here, I believe. Um, can you say hi, Ruth? I don't know if you're. Hi, everyone. Hey, Ruth. Um, she's one, she's our field officer that's working really close with all the, the communities that we work with out here. And, uh, we have got Caroline Dama. Um, Dama, can you say hi? Hi everyone. Yeah. I, I'll let Dama, uh, introduce herself. Sorry. I should have let Ruth can introduce herself as well. Dama, tell us about yourself a little bit. Um, hello everyone. Um, thank you for the invite. I uh, like, uh, we pointed out, uh, I'm with Grassroots Economics Foundation and we're implementing the projects here in uh, Kenya. And we've been expanding to some other parts of Africa. And uh, we look uh, forward to sharing our experience and hopefully also to hear more about what you're doing in the other parts of the world. I'm mostly most interested in how we can customize and make sure that uh, it can be able to adapt to the emerging challenges, especially in terms of building community resiliency in uh, COVID-19 related issues. And as Will talks, he'll show how we've been helping with that, the partners that we've built, and how, especially for low-income communities that live day by day, and they don't even have money for basic needs, how the community inclusion currency has been a really empowering tool for them to be able to meet those needs. Thank you, Ruth. Yeah, Ruth, maybe just say a little bit about what you do. Sorry to have skipped you there. Okay, uh, I'm the project coordinator for Grassroots Economics Foundation, and mostly what I do together with a group of field officers is we ensure that the users in the community are able to trade on daily basis using the CICs that we provide to them. And we also help groups that really want to save in Sarafu be able to also purchase food that they can send to, they can actually sell to users who are having Sarafu in the community. Especially now with the issues of COVID-19, we understand that many people in Kenya, especially in formal settlements, they do not have enough of Kenya shillings. So most of their needs are not met on time. Therefore, with Sarafu or with our community currency, they are able to use it to purchase food for their families. And they're also using it to, to purchase medicine when, whenever they become sick in their communities. So right now, I feel like it's the boom for us because many people want to join the project since the national currency is not enough at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. And I, I think we also, thanks Ruth, I think we also have Njambi on the line too. Can you say hi, Njambi? Maybe she'll come in later. But okay, so I, I can maybe start with a little bit of background on you know how we started this stuff and then we can get into you know like how we work with communities and I think Kind of where we want to go in this is you know what are some of those kind of concrete steps in uh, you know I, I, working with communities uh creating that sort of ownership and buy-in around uh the concept and you know how to create these kind of stable economies um 
and and I I think most of this I would like to just kind of open up into questions. So I'll I'll talk kind of in a chunk, and then we'll kind of open up to questions, and then myself and Ruth and Dama can all kind of answer those. And sound good? Um, so I, I originally started this stuff. Um, you know, I I worked a bit in the U.S. with um, studying Berkshires and going around the world and studying you know how Veer Veer worked. And there was a lot of these kind of old community currencies like in Curitiba and uh, Bancos Palmas. And so there's this really rich history around it. And actually, it was uh, you know Bernard Leotard was writing books about this stuff for years. Um, so it was kind of back in like. 2000 or so that I, uh, 2000 maybe in one, um, that I read The Power of Money. And um, I had already been going from physics into economics. I was just super excited about the idea that people could create their own currencies. And what, what does that mean really? Can people create their own credit systems? Can we do it without um, you know, enriching banks to the degree we are now? You know, what, what kind of systems need to be in place for a community to come together and, and make those decisions. And, um, and to me, I, I lived a lot uh, on different permaculture kind of communes. And I was really, really excited about this idea that, uh, uh, you know, we could, we could make that decision ourselves, that we can empower communities to create their own, their own finance. And I ended up uh, coming to Kenya with the Peace Corps. And uh, the, the, the first community that we worked with, um, was basically it was a slum outside Mombasa and this was a project called Ecopesa and essentially what we did was we got together and had meetings with the businesses in the community often through the elders and the chiefs um, and you know coming in as a as a as a foreigner like I, I think I had an advantage on that because to some degree I was working with a local NGO also so there was sort of that role of kind of trusted alien, right? That's not, you know, like everyone knew I wasn't trying to make a profit out of them. At least that's what they assumed. Um, and, you know, they, they sort of assume, uh, you know, that it's some sort of donor project or something like that. So I, it's something that we can talk more about, but that sort of like initial trusted party coming in and saying, hey guys, let's come have this meeting together. Let's, let's get together and come up with some ideas. And I basically, got a room full of about 75 uh, business owners in the community along with elders in the community and, and other kind of trusted parties and I showed them videos of what they did in Curitiba or what they did in Banquos Palmas in, uh, in Brazil um, and I showed them uh, Berkshires in the US and I said hey here's these people in other places they've come up with uh, a way to create their own medium of exchange and with the with the, the idea that there's enough goods and services in this community and enough demand to, to double or triple you know, the, the, the circulation of, of trade um, uh, in that community. Um, and I, I, you know, it, it sort of resonated with everyone. They, you know, like understanding how barter works uh, was, it, you know, it's obviously already part of, of the community. Um, and there's a lot of informal debt going around and, and things like that. So it just, it kind of made sense. And, and so we, uh, we came up with some rules around guarantors, you know, like, so people would be allowed into the network as long as they had guarantors behind them. Um, and they would all get a certain amount of them. We decided how many would be printed. And then we, we took pictures of the communities and put them on the pieces of paper. And we went and printed those vouchers. We handed them out equally to all of those businesses. They could start trading them. And um, there was also some donors involved as well that wanted to support things that uh, like waste collection and uh, tree planting in that area. Well, um, and so that, yeah, yeah. Go so ahead. some uh, some people are asking us for you to speak a little bit slower. Oh, sorry, guys. Yeah, it's okay. So, no problem. Yeah, no, it's a common complaint. Um, so so there was a, there was two sides of it. One was the community got their sort of airdrop. And then we also had donors that would come in and say, um, we want to basically buy those vouchers off of you over time, okay? And that was really the first model we used and it was a very kind of donor centric uh, model behind it. Um, and essentially the donors wanted activities to happen. So the donors basically had a certain amount of the vouchers that we would issue out for community service work. So us kind of representing these donors um, with a local NGO in Kenya, we're, we're going in and saying, okay, if you collect trash, if you recycle it, we'll give you five 
shillings of these vouchers. And it was the business community that would organize these activities um, because the vouchers would go to them, right? They, they, people would collect trash or plant trees. We give them vouchers, we verify that work was done. The people, the, the businesses would then say, here, buy our stuff with those vouchers. The businesses would then even circulate them more. They would pay for local labor, spread them amongst themselves. And at the end of every month, we would buy off a certain amount of those vouchers. So that was their original kind of Ecopesa concept. Um, and it was really simple, um, but it got to the point where that was, that was it. There was no more donor funds behind it. And we bought back all the vouchers and that was the end of the program. And, but it was great. Like that was the idea that we said, okay, we've, we've done five X at least what we would have done if we had just given the people money and we created, you know, in terms of the trash collection and there was the secondary circulation. And we tried to measure that secondary circulation with, with little, um, you know, uh, um, barcodes, you know, where we'd write the numbers down, the little serial numbers of the vouchers and we had grad students helping. And, and so we tried to measure this, this circulation in the community. It was very hard to do. Um, but it, it, everyone really liked it. There was quite a few of these community, smaller like pockets of the community groups that never exchanged their vouchers back and just kept trading them amongst themselves. Um, and so the, the next iteration of that was to say, well, what, how could we do this without donor funding? Um, and so we, we went into this community um, where we did the same concept. And this is where like Dama came in and was helping us um, basically bring this community together and say, you guys are the backing yourselves. And so we had the same kind of meetings with the whole community. We, we created all these vouchers and distributed them, but there was no donor funds behind it at all. And the community could basically buy from each other um, and it would circulate. And, you know, it was, it was a smaller network. There wasn't, uh, there were some key businesses that ended up being the, the backers of it. And that, that continued on for quite some time. I mean, it worked quite well. We got, we got a lot of awareness from the government that didn't like the program. Because um, again, we were on paper vouchers and this was a time when there was a lot of Al-Shabaab and you know, secessionism talks about the coast and things like that. So that was a, that was a really hard time for us. Uh, you know, Dama and I were both in jail for a while and uh, we, but we eventually got out of court and, and they said, you know, there's no law being broken here. And we ended up expanding that program to I think it was five other communities um, all over, you know, somewhere in Nairobi, somewhere more rural, um, and doing the same basic thing. And what we found was that, it, well, a lot of challenges in that model. And, and that model is similar in a way to how you would hear of like mutual credits, um, if you're familiar with that term, um, or lets or sells um, in France or Switzerland, you might have heard that, um, where basically it's, it's circulating in a closed network and there's really, it's really hard for people outside of that network to sort of trust those vouchers. Um, and about two years ago, we got into, um, well, actually in 2015, we started moving toward a digital voucher program. And just by going digital, um, we started using the USSD codes. It was a bit too expensive to really roll it out at the time. It was, the expense was the telecom at the time just to use those menus. Um, but that got cheaper and cheaper. And then at the same time, we also got um, involved with, with blockchain. And we were originally looking at using um, Bitcoin. Um, and we just, we didn't have developers and we were just, you know, like it, even just like, you know, being able to trade 0 0.0001 Bitcoin, stuff like that. It was just like, in, there was no good interface for it at the time. Um, and then we got onto looking at Ethereum um, and we found out about these Bancor contracts, um, which had this concept of a bonding curve in them. And the idea there was basically to say, well, can communities create a collateral system such that there can be a membrane, a connection between national currency and their local currency, and also therefore between all the local currencies. So could, you know, can, can Grace set up a, a currency in Mombasa that has a value that people can verify on chain, on, on the blockchain, um, that someone in Nairobi can say, yes, I, I can verify that value. It has this much collateral behind it. Sorry, I've got some dogs. Um, and be able to convert it to a currency in, in Nairobi. And could the, the, that exchange price um, between those communities kind of map 
to trade and balance between the communities. And so it, it did two things for us. One, it gave us a way to say how much currency should we print, you know, how much currency should we mint now, you know, digitally, like what's the rule behind it. Um, and it also gave us an ability to say, well, if someone wants to add more reserve, add more of that collateral, can we mint some more currency and vice versa? Can someone holding the currency decide to pull out from that pool? And so the idea was that, uh, that the community owns their reserve pool and it's up to them to decide, you know, how, as they're pulling out and as their, as their, um, their, their, their currency value, their exchange value to the national currency starts to drop. And as people put more currency in, their value goes up. And so this is sort of the mechanics of, the, of this bonding curve. Now, what we've done, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll end here quickly, is basically that um, as of this year, we, um, we went on to a new blockchain. We're on XDAI right now. I, I'm not sure how long we'll be on that blockchain. Um, but we also basically lumped all of the currencies we developed in previous years into one with the idea that using this one currency, people could basically consume it, that like these community groups, they could, they could be using it kind of like as an introduction. And, and that introduction is really mixed in with Red Cross right now. Um, they could get introduced to the concept and then they can use that currency, pull out the, the X die behind it and, and put it into their own reserve, right? And so, because in the past, all of this, you know, like the printing we've done and all this kind of stuff was, was really centralized. And even the creation of the, of the tokens and everything was still us doing it. So, you know, we've been, we're moving towards this and we were hoping to be there already by now, but we want communities to, to really develop everything of their own from scratch. And so this is sort of the, the, the journey we're on right now. And, and just in the last, I mean, just to give you some figures, like we've gone up over 350% usage in the last month. Um, we're almost at, I think, roughly 20,000 people who have registered. Um, you know, in, in terms of trade, we're seeing anywhere from 7000 to $10,000 a day of, of trade within, within the network. Um, and uh, the, it's, it's, it's right now filling a huge gap, right? And so there's, there, the, the impetus behind it right now is, you know, Red Cross volunteers are going out and saying, you know, here's what's going on with COVID, you know, wear a mask. And if you register for this, you get an airdrop. And so we have a whole bunch of little rules that we can kind of go over of how we, we deal with the vouchers and how they can actually exchange those vouchers back for the reserve that's behind it. Um, and, and right now with this currency, Red Cross is the one providing that reserve pool um, that they're pulling out of. So there's a lot of trust in the system around that. Um, and, uh, and we're able to basically establish a credit system um, without, uh, having to have a hundred percent of that money right now behind it. Um, and so that's basically, you know, enabling these communities to start really, really trading with each other. And maybe I, I can give it back to maybe Dama, um, to just give us an idea of, you know, on the ground in the community, how, how things are working and, and then maybe, um, we can open up for questions and Ruth can kind of answer some of those. Thanks, Julia. Yes. Yeah, so, um, I think, uh, William talked more about the setup. I, I just want to touch a bit about uh, how it impacts the community and especially in terms of um, this is essentially a bottom-up approach. Uh, most of the time when you look at projects, uh, maybe you're a donor or you're an implementing agency and you come up with ideas of what you think is suited for a community. Essentially the premise behind our community inclusion currency is that you're giving the community the tool to come up with decisions themselves essentially you are giving them resources so that they can choose where will they want to spend these resources. Most of the time you'll notice that uh, in times of um, calamities or even like right now people are going through COVID, there's a tendency for the economy to slow down. And most of the time people's inclination is to reduce their consumption. They want to save their money because of uncertainty. So essentially the CIC, provides a mechanism for people to continue their local economic activity. It's providing a way for them to continue paying for goods and services, even when the national currency is in short supply. Essentially, you are saying in the coming few days, or even since COVID started, 
more and more people lost their jobs, so they don't even have access to the national currency. And so by doing this, essentially, it's promoting stability in the local markets. It acts as a counterweight to, uh, to a slowing national or global, or global economy. People tend to see it as countercyclical. So people have less of the national currency, they sort of have a fallback plan. They can do this. And then William talked about Red Cross. So when you think about it, Red Cross usually comes either to prevent uh, post disaster. And so they're helping people that have already gone through disaster. But here is a mechanism that we're able to give to Red Cross for, for them to help people that are already going through the disaster. So CIC is a tool for that. So as government is planning, how do we help these people? They can already keep up their trades. In the past, uh, for some of the communities, for me, what I find most empowering is the ability to save the national currency and then pull their resources together. Ruth will touch a bit on what we call charmers. They are essentially saving groups. When they started, they are like merry-go-rounds, and it's almost like a copy mechanism for communities. We don't have money. I don't know what to eat. So I'll join a saving group. And what we do, maybe we save a dollar every week, and then we are 20 of us, and we give one person. And then most of the time, all that goes into paying debt. But then if they have the CIC to meet their basic needs, when they get that, they can use it to build their own social security, add value to community on initiatives. We have one such community that the initiative was to build a portion mill. So they pulled their resources, they built that portion mill, and it was a community-owned business. And because it's community-owned, people could go to the portion mill to access our savings using the community inclusion currency. The portion mill could in turn also provide employment opportunities. So it's good to look at the CICs with our multiply effects in terms of encouraging saving, in terms of also encouraging communities to be, uh, they're sort of employing other people, so they're providing employment opportunities. Most of the time, if I don't have money, somebody comes to me, I can't, I can't pay you. But if I have the CIC, I know I can pay someone in CIC. They can go to any of us in the communities. William talked to us, sort of when we started, it was almost like a mutual trade, but a system. And essentially at the back of their mind that stays. Essentially it's like a promissory note within the community. Yes, it's a promise that we are here to back each other up. You don't have money, you have the community inclusion currency. This is something that is ours. And as long as you're in these communities, you don't have to go hungry. You can come to any one of us and you can access a good or a service. And then in terms of the reserve, being able to bring in community uh, organizations like Red Cross, and they say that um, one good example is that most of the time donors, when they give donations to maybe a village, so they come in, they give all this donation in Kenya shilling. What usually happens is that the moment they drive their cars out, you get these really big traders that don't stay within that village. They come in and they sell their wares. So in a matter of one week, all the money has been pulled out. The whole premise behind the community inclusion currency for us is building local. Essentially, since you're spending it within the, that locality, even though we're able to expand it with the digital currency, you are encouraged to build the local institutions that are within the community. So it's in terms of also fortifying institutions that are already there, and also for them to be freed up of the worry of meeting their basic needs, and for them to ask other questions about their well-being. To finish, I think I'll give one example. When we started in one of the communities, Miani, so we, like we pointed out, we are doing an environmental project. So we'd come, we have these really big ideas. We're like, okay, we are going to bring tanks, and they're like, yes, yes. We come next, I think we should bring a water pipe, they're like, yes, yes. Because we are not asking the basic questions. Are you eating three times a day? No. Are you, is your child sick? No. Is your child walking two kilometers to come home and they can't eat? We don't ask those questions. The community inclusion currency exists to help communities meet those small questions. So within six months of us giving them that, they were so empowered that when we would go and maybe suggest improvements in the community, they're like, no, we think I think you should do this instead. And so that's really good in terms of an indicator of how it can bring about positive change in the community. I think uh, Ruth can add more, especially in terms of charmers. I find the whole um, 
concept with it, Shama, so fascinating. And I think a direct connection in cashing out Shamas, right? I think you have mentioned that before, Will. You're asking about the cashing out, yes? Yeah, yeah, I guess, because uh, uh, this yeah. is the part that I think it will be very interesting for all of us to understand about this cashing out. And I know that there is a, a sort of kind of an agreement uh, being done with the shamans specifically for the money that has been donated yeah. from the Red Cross. So if you can explain a little bit more about that, it will be great. Okay. Yeah, so, so with, with, the, with the Sarafu currency, I don't know, if there is Ruth on still? Yes, I'm still yes. Oh, I'll just keep it. I hear that. Maybe you can describe how it works with the chamas. Okay, before I describe that, there's a question that has been asked. Any sense of how many people total are in the system? We have about 19,000 people in the system who are actually using Sarafu. These are people who are in marginalized communities around Kenya. So with the chamas, how we've been working with them is we come into the community, we find this is our already existing groups, so we don't form new groups. And in these uh, existing groups, they've been saving in Kenya shillings. But you see, at times when they do not have that Kenya shillings, when they don't have the national currency, they're not able to save on that particular day. So we requested them that if, even if they do not have the national currency, they can still save using our currency, which is the CIC Sarafu, then when they save with this, they can as well take loans using it. When they take the loan, they cannot go to exchange it, but rather they can use it to purchase food, they can use it to pay school fees, and they can as well use it to pay laborers who are farming in their gardens. And then at the end of every month, we normally check the accounts. We see how many Sarafu, or rather how many CIC they have into their account, and then we are able to exchange for them in Ken to Kenya shillings. And this exchange only happens if we have enough in our reserve, as Will had mentioned. So any, any chama that has already given out loans to members in the community can as well request for this exchange, and then we give them 50% of their exchange. So at the moment, we have 100 chamas, 100 savings group in, the group, in, in our system, and these groups vary in numbers from 10 people to 25 people maximum per group. Will, maybe you can add something that I've left out. No, I, I think maybe it's good to just talk about like, you know, how we're sort of envisioning and work, I mean, how we've worked at the communities in the past in terms of like actually creating them. Um, because one thing that's sort of, I think, confusing right now is that like, we are going around with Red Cross and ourselves and we're basically saying, here is a support token you can use um, to fight, you know, uh, uh, lacking supply chains and being able to trade with each other like right now. And so there's this huge adoption right now. And it's, and, and from that perspective, like there's still a community centered approach to that because one, you know, you're coming in with Red Cross sort of in terms of a, a holding trust in the community. You're still going in through the chiefs and the businesses in that community. And you're, you know, you're building that sort of trust network um around the uh, what is behind it and in that in that case it's really donor funds that that's behind it um and versus where we really want to go in terms of so that's like disaster response now we're getting into you know and wanting to go back into recovery and and resilience mode and that really involves communities creating their own version of these things and so i think that's you know to me it really depends on you know what kind of community you're dealing with right now on one side this sort of aid version of it that we're doing has been really effective and it's going to continue for a long time. I'm, I, the hope is that Red Cross will roll these out all over the country in Kenya. We've already done feasibility studies in Malawi, Ethiopia, um, and Dama was just in Zimbabwe. Um, and so I think that will continue, but using that as a vehicle for training and enabling people to create their own versions of these things too, I think is, is really the sustainability and the, the goal and where we've come from really is, is, is like that. It's, um, so I feel like we're sort of in an in-between phase right now, which is, is effective and it's interesting to look at. And especially if you're working with aid organizations or municipalities that just want to introduce a credit system into a community, get people to trade with it, give them some trust in some collateral behind it. Um, this concept of bonding curve, I 
think is, is it fits well into that. It really solves a lot of problems that we've had in the past with the pure kind of, you know, mutual credit model, or even the pure kind of, you know, if you think about like Bitcoin, you know, you make a token, you don't really back it with anything, you get people to trust it, but what's really behind it. And, you know, in lieu of creating a network of hundreds of thousands of people trading Bitcoin, which is not terribly easy, especially when you're coming from a community group, like, can you add a collateral behind it? Um, even a very small collateral uh, uh, pool behind it and sort of build trust to be able to exit that system and re-enter that system. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting concept. And I, I think maybe I just kind of open it up and, and uh, to the room and Grace to sort of see yeah. what, so what are, where do people want to talk about, yeah. I, I wanted to just uh, touch upon several things that you had mentioned. So you have, we would like to have the, the overview of the components that this actually have. You know, what are we looking at uh, when we are in this implementation mode and we want to go and assess whether a community is, is the right community and how feasible it is to implement something like this? Uh, are you, um, you're not on mute. You're muted. Yeah, that, um, I mean, basically when we, when we look at a fresh community and we've gone in there, like the first thing we do is kind of, you know, going back to how we started these things ages ago, it's bringing people together and saying, what would, you, what would you commit into essentially a barter credit? What would you, if we're gonna create a credit in this community, what could it be backed by locally, right? So we always, you know, I, I don't, the worry is that, um, you know, when we talk about bonding curves and adding collateral national currency, you think of like, that's the backing behind it, but that's not the backing, that's, that's a collateral, you know, it, it's essentially a membrane that connects it to national currency and other currencies. What's the real backing behind it is people accepting it for their goods and services or the municipality accepting it for taxes. So, or, uh, you know, local businesses coming in and saying, you know, we were, are going to accept a certain amount of this. And there's a lot of good examples. Maybe I, I, Carla can probably give us some as well, but the, um, like Sardex, for instance, in Italy has a really nice methodology around going into businesses and saying, hey, we want to we give you access to this community currency system in Sardinia and across Italy here. Uh, there's all these other businesses as part of it already. Would you be willing to co commit, you know, 10,000 euros of, of uh, seats in your restaurant for the next year? And if you do that, then you can have a credit line of 10,000 euros in this, in this system. And, and that's, that's their starting point in a way. And you can also use those credits as advertising in the network. They really help you connect to other businesses to clear those credits. So if you have holding a lot of them, what can I spend them on? Um, can I add them to employee salaries? Can I, you know, what, you know, what are all the ways you can use them? So the sort of stage one is really identifying community resources. You know, what are all those resources? You know, um, as much commonly needed, a, a game we often play with, with uh, initial kind of committees that are looking at these kinds of things is like, imagine you're planning a wedding, you know, and we give them all some currency. I think I did this with you, uh, Grace, in Japan. And you say, well, yeah. uh, give them a chance to trade as if you're trading like for a week and see, see what happens. Like, is there things missing in that network? How do you create that initial buy-in? Um, and generally, it's also, it's also about having trusted members in that community, the churches. Um, we've got churches in Kenya that accept it as their tithing or sadaka here and um, things like that. I mean, there's, there's, you know, local political members sometimes, you know, sometimes not. Um, uh, the, 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 the local wholesale shop or the farmers, that, that it's, that's such a key, key so thing. If you don't have that backing, it's, there's nothing... There's nothing really there. And for us, like right now, with, Ken, with, with, with Red Cross, sorry, it's, it's just, um, it's, their, it's their donor funds also that is providing some of that space as well. So they're buying back the currency one-to-one, -one, right? That's not on the bonding curve, right? And so that, that tells people that over time, they know that there's some commitment behind it. Yeah, go ahead. So I think that the, you, you talked about trust. So we have... Uh, the certainty of some services and goods that need to be part of the collateral, but it does help to have uh, to get started with some kind of a funding source, such as for the one like from the Red Cross, where they donated funds to this. And this also brings a very interesting model for NGOs when they are donating uh, funds or aid to any type of communities and they want to make sure that these funds are using by that community 
you know, to put money into these currencies and ensure that people will be using it locally, right? So that's a, that's a very good way and, and very interesting enough is something very related to what the World Bank has done over 20 years ago with community development uh, initiatives. So yeah. that's, um, that's great. Now, you talked about the increase in usage, 350%. How, how does that happen? How, how does an increase like that takes place? What happened? What have you done? Yeah, basically, I would say, I mean, we can ask uh, the, the other team, but I would say a lot of that has been um, Red Cross coming in with their volunteers, right? So they have a huge, huge network, you know, everywhere in the world. You know, I think they've got 1.5 million employees and even more volunteers. And so those volunteers are going out and training people of COVID. And they're also saying, you know, you can, you can use this to trade with your neighbor and help each other. Um, that alone, I mean, because, you know, our entire staff, I think we're at, you know, eight people now um, and we're, you know, trying to cover all of Kenya. It's extremely hard and, and just spreading. We've been spreading a lot by word of mouth and, you know, we have, there's a referral system. I, I, on the chat, I shared some of the rules we, we use. So like if you refer another user, you get another hundred Sarafu, you know, there's a bunch of these kinds of rules. Um, but I mean, just, just, having that network of the cross coming in and saying, Hey, uh, let's, let's try this. Um, and yeah, we're, we're buying those vouchers off every month, a certain amount from community groups. Um, so that gives that, you know, people know that eventually there is, there is money behind it. It pegs it one-to-one. -one. So it's always one-to-one -one in the community, you know, even though, you know, on the bonding curve, it may not be one-to-one -one anymore. There's still that local commitment of one-to-one. -one. And I, that's really important in terms of maintaining trust. We don't, we think of the bonding curve as sort of a secondary market and they affect each other, but essentially locally there's, there's that huge commitment behind it. So I, and then, you know, the, the issue with COVID right now is, is huge. I mean, there's, people just don't have money and, and we've always seen that this sort of counter cyclic effect, you know, where um, like with Weir as well, I think they've, they've had some papers around like, you know, as the Swiss franc would drop in value, the Weir credit would get more and more usage and vice versa. Um, and so I, I think it's just a textbook example of that. People just don't have a medium of exchange. Yeah. That's, a, that's a very interesting point. And we... Add to what William was saying, if you allow me. Yeah. I think yeah. uh, when you talk about the 50%, I think it attests to the fact that there's a gap that's, that people are in need, yes? Otherwise, there wouldn't be such a huge increase. And that people are saying, here is a tool that would really work for me. So I think it uh, talks to that. Apart from that, um, I think um, the other thing that we can really also peg it to is the whole peer-to-peer. -peer. Because once one community uses it and they say that this is something that works for me and they trust it and they know that this is something that can help my neighbor. And then I think magic starts from there because then now it spreads by word of mouth. And it's really helped us that now we have a partner that maybe has the capacity to really grow exponentially but that was really important. But I was also seeing a question here that I wanted to respond to. Someone was saying 10 to 15 members of a group, maybe they're basically family. I think it was Harris. So I, um, I don't know, by most of those communities, it is rarely so. Ruth was talking about uh, working with the existing groups. So it's really important even for sustainability you don't go and restart groups. You go and work with what's existing there. That's the whole premise of trust. You get a community, say it says work as long as there's trust in the community. Rarely do we get these saving groups with the family members because most of the time, family members rarely trust each other with money. I don't know, Ruth, that's true, yes? So most of the chamas that we're having or saving groups that we're having, it's uh, usually women and some of them could come from different villages. And they're like, I am really in need right now. And I need, they work as economic empowerment groups, but they also work as social groups. They come here and they share, they share problems. And apart from that, they get funding for their own small projects. And it's there that they share ideas and contribute to the whole community well-being. It's a system. That's very good. We, we have, um, also looked at the, at the documentation you have produced and, and it showed that the purchasing power had increased over 38%. I mean, that's significant and considering that people, most people are living below the poverty line. This yes. is quite, uh, you know, 
incredible. So can you say something a little bit about that? I mean, in terms of like measuring impact, I mean, it's, it's, you know, like if you look at, I, I think I shared it on the chat there, but there's a, we have a dashboard of just looking at the trade that's happening. You can see it based on the blockchain transactions. And then we, we also have a database that identifies like what is being purchased, like categories, like food and stuff. And so you'll see some kind of gross categories there, like food, water, um, you know, education and stuff. But uh, um, to like, for us to say, okay, like this, this woman is trading a thousand of these over a month and she represents, she's got a family of five people. Um, what does that mean? You know, and, and she said she bought food with it or, you know, we've tracked that on the network. What does that really mean? And, uh, you know, in some cases, I mean, this is, this is where we have a lot of research groups coming in and, and doing it. So we have some research papers you can read on the website, uh, like slash research on, on grassycon.org. Um, but generally it's like, how many meals are they eating a day? Um, how many customers are they getting in a day? Uh, you know, it's, it's that kind of stuff that we're trying to measure in, the, in those communities. And like, you know, right now it's the difference between, you know, eating a meal maybe once a day with your family versus eating two meals a day with your family. Um, Makes a difference. That, those are the kinds of things we're trying to, you know, and a meal, a meal for a person is maybe 20 shillings or 20 sodaku. Um, I mean, when I first did this stuff, uh, you know, even back with Bangla Peza, we were, we, we had researchers going around and we would say one 20 shilling note, you know, like one of these little, little pieces of paper notes that we would have was changing hands twice in a day. And that was representing about 700 meals in a year. This little piece of paper was, was creating 700 meals uh, in, in a year. And, and just like that concept is crazy. It's a crazy idea that this little paper, like without it, there's 700 meals not being eaten. I, I, and so I, I, there's a lot of work to do in terms of like control group studies and all that stuff. And there's a lot, there's a lot of work being done right now on that. So we hope to have a lot more studies out um, to sort of like look at that data of transaction data that we, that we can see now and say, okay, does that mean that they're saving more of their shillings and they're not actually eating more? What do they do with those shillings? You know, like what sort of, what statistics can we get on that stuff? So that stuff, hopefully this year we'll have a lot more papers around that but that concept that you know this 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 one piece of paper creates 700 meals more meals in a community than were there before is really a you know it's just a powerful idea and it really was shocking when we first started this stuff and it was shocking to everybody um you know even the government at the time they didn't really like the idea because it was you know um people were trying to bribe police with it and uh, <laughs> you know it's just who gets to print money and you get into a lot of that those types of issues so um yeah Certainly is a very powerful uh, initiative and, and we know that, that this can be the case elsewhere as well. So I'm, I'm sure that also there are going to be, you know, variances and, and, and differences between the communities that we could implement this into. And uh, in any case, what I wanted to, I know that we are about seven minutes away from, from finalizing this. We are welcoming you to stay with us a little bit longer than, than the time that was allocated so we can have open conversations with Will and Carolina and Ruth. So therefore, you know, don't feel pressured to leave. I just wanted to say that um, this is something very serious. Uh, Blockchain for Humanity is taking this at heart. We believe that this is the way that we can bring prosperity into communities. And we're gonna find a way into implementing this in you know, various parts of the world, but we want to start where it's closer to us right now, which is South America. And now that we have Dieguito here with us, we would love to hear your comments about that because this is something that really is important to push forward and to demonstrate to the world that this is possible and that we don't need institutions to rescue us. Yes, I, I think the, the more we do in a self-organized way and you know, the, the more the society gives responses without relying uh, on on centralized organizations, the more anti-fragile the organization, uh, the society will become. So, so I'm all for it. <laughs> I think self-organization is like, uh, you know, the, the way to go. And, and in this crisis, you are seeing like both uh, the tension between the, the two mindsets, uh, you know, uh, emerging. No, so you have um, centralizing. Uh, responses and also like with some totalitarian if you will uh, mindset and also you see a lot of self-organizing 
people giving responses. We have people like, uh, for example, cooking food in their homes for 10, 20, even 30 people every day, just as a way to contribute to, to those that, who are more vulnerable and they are doing it in a self-organized way without the aid of any government or central institution. Yeah. So if we can foster, you know, if we can put these technologies to the service of these self-organized uh, efforts and then we will create a more resilient, not resilient. I like the anti-fragile model because it's not only going back to normal, which is what resiliency achieve, but getting stronger and smarter as, as we face uh, challenges. No, I like the reframing. I think <laughs> a lot of stuff. So I think that's the word that I'm going to use. And Carla, I would love to invite you as well to, to share a little bit about your experience with the, with the community currencies. Thank you, Grace, and thank you, Viva, and the team for, for sharing the ideas. Uh, I'm just, I just shared the link of my project. It's, it's called Cambiatus. We are highly, highly aligned in the in purpose and motivations with uh, grassroots economics. Um, we have a community already working with our technology, which uses blockchain to create social currencies um, in Costa Rica, Brazil, and Barcelona. And uh, we have been focusing a lot in, in the co-design process. So every community designed their own currency under their own rules. And also on the interface, we use a web app that can be used on the phone or your, on your laptop. Uh, but our users are non-techie people, right? So not, not the usual blockchain user at all. So having a, a good interface is crucial and we have a lot of work on that and super open and happy to collaborate with uh, Bill and his team if, if there is an opportunity and with uh, Blockchain for Humanity in developing something in our countries. It is crucial. It is crucial to create alternatives and be more resilient and having not only one national currency that you rely on 100%, but having alternatives and alternatives under own or our, our own terms and rules. So that's what we did. That's wonderful. Thank you, Carla. So we opened uh, for any questions, anyone? Bring them on. I guess uh, are all the questions being answered, the ones that were posted on the, on the panel? There, there was a good one on the chat that was, you know, can you do these things without national currency? And I think the mm -hmm. answer is definitely yes. And, you know, we did them for years without national currency. And, um, and even, you know, like looking at community currencies that have developed over the years, like, first of all, even this concept of the bonding curve, like you don't necessarily need to use DAI like we're using. You don't need to use a fiat connected uh, reserve. You could have, and we did this actually last year with 12 currencies in Kenya, you could have 12 currencies that connect to each other using a virtual reserve. Like they decide to create a reserve token that is divided amongst those communities. And it still serves that same purpose of measuring trade balance between those communities, which I think is really, really important. And I'm, I'm not a huge advocate of DAI or any sort of stable coin or reserve token. I think that in the future, we really, really need to yeah. establish uh, common reserves that connect community currencies together. And so the, the equations for this bonding curve, and it's, it's sort of the original, these Bancor formulas that, um, you know, it's, it's, it, they're fairly simple. It's like two equations that basically just say, if I've got a community over here and, I've, and I'm doing a, a nice mutual credit between all the businesses in the community, and Carla has one over there, that if we both decide on a common reserve that we've created, we say, if I'm trading over to Carla's community and she, she can convert it into hers, now there's a trade imbalance between us. So if Carla spends something back at ours, she gets a little bit more value for it, basically. That's it. So we're mapping trade imbalance, like trade deficit, onto that exchange price using a virtual reserve. So th that concept, I think, is really like the main maybe if anything that we're doing that's sort of unique here in Kenya right now is sort of really trying to use that concept in different ways. So it's, you know, connecting to donor funds, for instance, but also just being able to connect community currencies together. And I, I still, I, I really want to push a lot of mutual credits uh, systems to think of in that way, just to say, well, okay, how could we connect with each other? What kind of technologies are there? And also, if we want to connect to, it, you can have multiple reserves, right? You can have pools of these. So if you want to have 
a fiat reserve, uh, you know, with the uh, euros, well, that it's up to you. So making those decisions now as a community becomes a new thing. So, we, you know, if we want to add a collateral pool, it also does a nice thing that it, it really solidifies your issuance rules, right? So if you're, you know, if you want to issue a billion tokens, okay, what, what's behind them? Unless you want to be the next Bitcoin, you know, on what basis are you issuing a billion tokens? Why? You know, what are they, what's behind them? So being able to say that on chain, whether it's, whether it's XDAI as the reserve, but if you can point to something and say, that's our, that's our collateral behind this, that the reason we're able to issue those tokens is because we've set some rules that, that relaxes a lot of people. Because if you come into a community currency space or, you know, economic space, especially with real businesses and you say, oh, I just printed these, you know, I've just printed 5 billion of them or how many did you print? I don't know. You know, like it, it's, it's really important to be able to track and say, you know, what's, there's something real behind it. Um, and, and that something real could be virtual, but it's real between you and let's say another community together. So anyways, I, I think that space is really huge. And I think starting these without national currency is totally possible as well. You don't have to have that reserve to begin with. You can start as a mutual credit and decide later on to say, okay, we want to establish now a contract on the blockchain to say how we connect to other communities and or how we want to connect to national currency. And I think that's that's the one of the powers of that we have with blockchain right now that's really, really exciting is to to really consciously kind of create vast ecosystems of currencies that could connect to each other. And and, and you said uh, exactly the key word here that the technology that we have right now is allowing us to really create this sort of basket of different type of assets, assets that we can use for collateral. And that's something that, you know, that's the, that's the power of, of the technology that we're seeing right now with DeFi, right? So using multi-collateral type of uh, reserves, is, it's the way to go. It gives more stability for as well for the, for the communities. So excellent. I, I leave it to any of you to ask questions. I don't want to get you to monopolize this so uh please do uh, ask questions or follow us as well uh, will is in our uh, telegram group so you can definitely continue the the chat with will i know kirill was uh kirill you asked a few questions which were very interesting as well about the red cross funds converted in uh from it was already answered in, in a way actually that they they well just just swap the crypto fiat to crypto. That's fine. I was curious because I I heard of something similar in the, in Kenya also uh, called the uh, CarePay. They do something similar in in terms of uh, using this this digital money to to cover the the insurance. I guess. Do, do you guys know them? Uh, I, they're working with clinics. I, I have we haven't connected a lot with them, but we should. Um, I, it's, actually, someone brought it up the other day too. So there's a lot going on in Kenya. It's a really rich space in terms of technology and innovation. It's so funny yeah. because it's funny because here I'm working with the founder of that uh, in the Netherlands. So oh, really? <laughs> can you okay, founded yeah. that. <laughs> well, please connect us. I would love to talk with them. Yeah, Good sure. to uh, for them to know as well. The, you're the founder of It Kids. Tell a little bit about what that because there's a bonding curve for us. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's always it always triggers my attention. Yeah, when I hear a bonding curve, that's exactly what I'm doing for it kids. I'll in, in, in short, it's a sort of a platform to incentivize the donors into their uh, charity for for kids. And uh, so I'm using also the bonding curve, but bonding curve on a sort of on steroids is the personal bonding curve, which is personal for every donor. So. Uh, well, long story short, every time then when money gets pledged for the NGO, then the, the donor gets in return the, the goodie, the asset uh, or the token that can be, uh, well, can be kept, kept or liquidated later on against the, the vault of bonding curve. So that's, uh, well. So it's like um, thinking uh, and kind of using the same system uh, instead of uh, charities. Um, the, it will create the charity as our community who has its own currency, and then the donors can add to that. Yeah. The, the idea actually to, to incentivize financially the regular donations, because as you know, well, in Bundan Curve, over the time, the price, well, in my, my case, the price will go down 
So it's always, there is always incentive to keep donating, to keep the stake better. That's uh, well, financial. So. Yeah. It sounds really similar. I mean, that's essentially what Red Cross is doing. Like, so as the, the we lost you. The bonding curve Red Cross is essentially minting acts with those tokens, right? And so, so if the bonding curve is right now this sort of nationwide thing, that's one thing. But they also want to do the exact same idea. Is like if there's a community group that's created their own bonding curve uh, around their community token, then Red Cross can look at that and say, oh, this is one way we can sort of invest in or support that community. So yeah. I think exactly. it's all, all of these like are the same, same concept is just kind of coming to fruition right now. A little bit of people saying, oh, okay, how, you know, yeah, it's really, it's really cool to hear because there's so many projects now that are basic, basically using that same idea. I know the common stack, I think Jeff just left, but they're looking at, uh, you know, how to create sort of continuous organizations and continuous governance, you know, using these models as well. Yeah, uh, this defies, it's, it's, it's quite, it's all about, about incentives to my mind. I mean, why would I join? Why would I put my time or money into this? Well, typically this is a basic question. Actually, right now there's a, a, a virtual hackathon ongoing called the Hack Money. And I'm also joining that, uh, as, yeah, uh, the, to, um, so what I'm doing actually, I'm uh, connecting the it kids with their saving protocols. So the compound, Aave, perhaps you've heard that. So that's basically the idea to incentivize even more their uh, uh, the donors and uh, the communities. So there, is, there will be some passive income to those. Uh, quite mind blowing. Awesome. What, what what's the project called again? I can read that for you. It's itkids.io. It kids. It it kids. E T H. Yeah. ETH. Okay. One of the our I would, I would like to ask uh, Will a question. Uh, what could what could be what can be improved uh, in the current model? Because I know that uh, he's struggling with the fees and uh, with the USSD uh, technology. Imagine that uh, you could uh, use the, all the smartphones. What could be the next steps? We have a few blockchain expert here, so yeah, if yeah. you can. Uh, say what, what could be the next step i i mean really the, the whole stack of the technology needs needs help in in lots of ways so thanks Yvonne. i mean you know like that everything from the blockchain we're using to the interface um so interface wise yeah we're using a telecom as our interface through this ussd stuff but there's a more and more and more smartphones around the cost to connect to the, the telecom is huge right now. I mean, per transaction, we're paying somewhere between, you know, a cent and 1.5 cents. And so, and that's not even just a transaction. That's also like a balance check or anything, uh, you know, using that system. So if you've got 10,000 of those in a day, you're talking maybe $200 in a day just for those 10,000 checks. Uh, you know, that's with a few thousand, you know, daily users. Um, so that's, that's a cost that you know we're trying to work with the the telecom to to help support some of that um but it, it's it's not easy um so yeah having a having an app uh would be really 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 help you know even just a web app uh, it doesn't even have to be android um that would that would help a lot just by itself and then there's all kinds of you know parts of the technology like the fiat you know on and off ramping like through red cross like we're doing that in bulk through bitcoin swiss right now um, and then we're doing a lot of manual conversions into, you know, taking ETH and uh, converting it to DAI, then bridging that across to a side chain called XDAI. There's a lot of technology there. There's some. There's a group um, uh, uh, working on. There's a lot of groups that, that are trying to help uh, different pieces of this, but we need a lot of uh, support on that as well. Um, and then on the the contract side, I mean, we're using the 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 current sort of a vanilla version of the Bancor contracts, but there's there's a lot that could be done around, you know, creating DAOs around these things. I mean, we're using kind of multi-sig wallets that sort of control that contract. It is it's pretty permissionless. Like once it's been deployed, um, there's a few things you can change on it, but um, generally you can't change a lot of the like you can never pull out the reserve again once you've put it in there. For instance, other than through burning your tokens, your community currency. Um, you can't like just all of a sudden mint more community. So once you put it in this contract, it's pretty much set in stone. There's a conversion fee where when you, when you deploy the contract, you can set a maximum conversion fee. And that 
conversion fee goes into the pool uh, in both directions. Um, so it actually grows the pool based on the conversions. It's also a nice kind of security mechanism. Um, so you can change that fee up to that max of whatever you set when you initiated it. Um, you can set, I mean, so some of these decisions for a community now where you're saying, okay, we've got $10,000 of backing, you know, that's been committed by the community. Let's say that's in goats and whatever the buyout is going to be, this sort of commitment of the communities, they've been issued to the community. Now they want to connect them to the curve. They have to decide how to do that. You know, how much collateral should they put in there? Um, we're working with block science, um, but we could use you know, more help also on, the, on uh, modeling all these things. Like you should be able to basically push a button, you know, put in your initial conditions as a community and say, okay, if, if we put this much collateral in and we have this type of trade volume, this is how volatile our, our price is going to be, for instance, right? Like, and so block science is working on some, some of the like, uh, you know, just hard analytical proofs around that and also being able to tweak those knobs, you know, so if you wanted to change your smart contract or your initial conditions, you can do those things. So there's, there's, you know, it's a full stack kind of thing. There's analytics, there's dashboarding, there's wallets, there's, you know, all of the above. Um, and there's a lot of open source stuff out there that looks really good for this stuff. It's just, you know, putting it all together um, and even just you know like a uh, Carol uh, Carla who is here from Cambiatas like for them I was gonna say is just looking into or helping them look into like you know connecting those currencies that, that they make together you know and um, yeah so what, what sorry what, what is the the main the, what are the main challenges that you face technology wise or, or, or mean, what are the missing pieces or the pain points that you face? So, so I understand yeah. how we can help from, from our side. Okay. So one, I mean, one is that we're, we're on a side chain right now. Um, and it's not, it's not a hundred percent clear what the future of that's going to be. So it's, I think it's really important to understand, you know, I, we all kind of, I, we've been sort of waiting for ETH2, Ethereum2 to come out and saying, okay, maybe we could be on that or being a shard of that. So I think it's really important. Like if you're going to, let's say you've got a, a big community and, and you're going to end up with a million users in that community. We lost you. We briefly lost you. Yeah. Um, Still lost him. But the question that arises in my head is is why maybe somebody else here can why why a sidechain was chosen or why they they, they were waiting for ETH two point zero because maybe if it's because of the limitations uh, it, using the public Dai, Ethereum X Dai has, has really really slow transaction fees that's that's zero point zero zero one cent. And at the same time, it's proof of authority. So in sort of a trusted parties are running, running the network. So it's good. It's, I'm also using that because it's a reasonable balance between their trust Ethereum has and a transaction fee Ethereum doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So it's mostly... Uh, for this first experience, they were looking for collateral that will be safe. I, I didn't hear very well Goose, what you said, but 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 the takeaway I'm, I'm having is that mostly the reason is, well. is low transaction fees. Why why the the side chain? Because maybe with there are some technical solutions to that, uh, like you know payment channels or or uh, optimistic rollups that we are working on. Uh, that are like can provide the same level of um, uh, you know low low cost fees without resorting to to more complex setups. No? He's so, back. He can maybe tell us as well, or or Wojtek will. <laughs> maybe I maybe I can say it, uh, and Will can then you know correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the way I understand it, it's just a big amount of transactions that need to be done by individual users. 
So even, even having payment channels or some level two solution like that would not fully alleviate the problem. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, imagine at the level where you've got a million transactions a day, I, you know, knock on wood, and they all need to clear face to face, right? So you have five seconds or 10 seconds at most where they need to clear. Um, and, you know, right now we're using the side chain in two ways, like, uh, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, just to be clear, like the, the system we're using right now is primarily Postgres, right? We're using a database to optimistically do clearing face to face, and then we synchronize with the blockchain. And so potentially you could do that, but you just don't want that synchronization to be very slow because you end up with a huge amount of problems. Um, I mean, doing that kind of thing is complicated. And, I think on a web app, you really wouldn't want to do that at all. Like you, because for us, like we're, because it's USSD, like we're also holding private keys, right? So it's not an ideal situation um, in a few ways. So if we move to a web app, ideally it's non-custodial and you're clearing stuff directly on a blockchain. So it's got to be super fast and it better not be very expensive. Yeah. You use light client for those to work. So, and you will not have a light client without proof of state blockchain. Yeah, I, yeah. We're, mm -hmm. I mean, so uh, the, what we're on now is in transitioning into a proof of stake blockchain. So POA is now, or not POA, XDAI is now becoming a proof of stake blockchain. Okay. okay. But I think also his challenges are, are not only on the side of transactions and so on, but since you're using uh, the, the mobile and the telecom uh, charges are being quite significant, it's like kind of moving away from that model. It's yeah, we would love to not be on that model. Um, I think we're still going to need to reach people without smartphones um, for a long time. So we may still have this kind of pockets where like you, you could consider us as grassroots one entity on the blockchain that represents, you know, right now 20,000 other users on the blockchain. We do create wallets for all of them and you can kind of see all those transactions, but we're still custodial in that sense of holding their private keys. Um, yes, because you are using the USS's the menu on the phones, no? To yeah, make it, yeah. yeah. And if you oh, use yeah, uh, yeah. SMS, they are expensive, I imagine. Very. So it's like, a, yeah, it's kind of a catch. Uh, yeah, it's the problem. same problem. And section, yeah. yeah. But, but what about, I mean, you said that smartphones are appearing more and more. Yeah. Would you say that that's, that trend is like making USSD obsolete or not needed soon or or you think it will take like uh, some years to yeah let's say we've transition. got another five five years like okay. before the okay you know like let's say the cheapest smartphone it's also data is a problem too but let's say the cheapest smartphone right now in kenya is something like uh fifty dollars ish and the cheapest feature phone is 10 right and so uh, you know that it, it, that's changing but okay. uh, and and also data uh, you know is expensive people like you know you leave your phone on for a second and it's eaten through your entire data and so that's a problem also um in in the early days of crypto but i don't know where the project uh, stays there were some projects uh, that were using overlays on top of the sim on the sim chip to to hold the keys uh, cool. yeah. I, I will I will check it out and they were like pretty inexpensive. I, I will check where that went. I know the the project was called something like thirty seven coins or something like that. Sure. I, I like check. regarding the telecom issue, you can have a look at the project called Altia, which is building their own uh, decentralized ISP. And they have their own hardware, they have their own software so that uh, you can use the hardware to create your own your own networks uh, and those networks can stay incentivized mm -hmm. so that uh, there's incentive to run a node which is like like a, a router esp that everyone can connect to and you can have an exit gateway to the public internet if you want or you can you can it can, it can be private as well and yeah. private. but that's a little bit tougher on the deployment no because you need to to set up the network and that will take some Well, they time. did it already. So they already have uh -huh. like a hardware like you can use, okay. you know, so you can take it. People right now are using it in US and like very remote areas. 
where they don't have, you know, that either access to internet and they need to connect, you know, the distant, the distant, you know, like some kind of remote, uh, remote fields. So they are using Altia to, to, to basically create this kind of network and yet okay. still keep it operational because there is, the, there is uh, this, the payment channels that, that are implemented on it so that, you know, the, the nodes stay incentivized to, to operate. Okay. So you, you, you imagine setting this up with uh, community centers or something like that, that they yeah, run so their, their own nodes? Yeah. So every community mm -hmm. could have its own, its own kind of, uh, its kind of router, right? It's mm -hmm. own kind of, you know, all the, all the spec antennas and, and so on that they provide you. And uh, then it would probably be also viable that, oh, if they already run a router, maybe they could also run a validator node, right? Okay. So you would have, you know, the, the option to, you know, have your own networking and don't be dependent on, you know, third party mm -hmm. that third party that have like some shitty service and they charge you a lot. And you have the, this possibility to, to throw on top of that your own validator nodes. So at some point you could transition into your, your own uh, pro state blockchain. Mm -hmm. Can you I want to share my, exp my experience just really, really quickly that a couple of years ago I was running here the blockchain well, payments for the open air festival and well, an open air festival is notorious of having bloody big, well, really, really bad internet connection, regardless of the country you are in. <laughs> so what, what I did is actually we, we used and we had to process the payments for beer and ice cream uh, of people really on blockchain. We wanted to have that. And uh, the way we solved that and instead of the, well, the payment where instead of doing the push payment, so it's not people who were paying, but rather their, well, shops who were pulling. And how we did it is that, well, we gave their wristbands uh, with the QR codes, with the private keys, obviously, that you should not, of course, <laughs> expose too much. But, uh, but uh, it was not that big money. But then people rather was, were just showing their the QR codes and scanning with people could scan and then pull the payment. They were authorized on a smart contract, specific people to pull the payment. So basically to take your tokens without you signing the transaction or whatever. So instead of push the pull, the way that then you can just handle, have uh, 10, 5, 25 uh, points, uh, places which have to have the connect, internet connection. Or even without this, you can still run the local blockchain over there. Is, is just if you just somebody said, run the uh, intranet, not mm -hmm. internet, but intranet uh, and the blockchain over just a couple of computers to laptop. <laughs> well, that's where. Yes. Yeah, like a, you you do like a mixture of like a local blockchain or a pri a permissioned blockchain. Locally, and then you synchronize with the public blockchain yeah, you, you, for you the balances or something like that. You can even initially run the, the mm -hmm. whole blockchain, but then, well, it's called split, split brain syndrome. You just pull the plug, and then mm -hmm. your, your blockchain gets uh, forked. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then connected later on, a couple of days later, or, well, depends on blockchain, and gets merged to the master. Uh, magic. I wanted to add a bit of context here. I'm hoping as we discuss we make sure that um, the whole aspect of inclusivity, some of the communities we are dealing with, one are illiterate. So, mm -hmm. and apart from that, the whole idea of the smartphone, they, they can only maybe access the banner phones. So even as we discuss this, we have to look at that kind of community or they are a farming community, so they don't even have access to electricity. So whatever situation, mm -hmm. like Will and I are always thinking of how do you, go about it in such a way that you're not adding to the challenges so that you dis don't disillusion these people. So if you make it really complex and then the person is already worried about mm -hmm. just buying food and now they have to go and work with a smartphone they can't understand or put a really long SSD code that they're not sure and send all that. So it's also thinking about that so that it's really centered on the user. And that is diverse enough and simple enough so that it can be really simple for them. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I, I just maybe add the two, like there's a lot of, you know, telecoms that are, have gotten into e-money in different ways. And like, the, you know, in Kenya, they, they have a lot of options. You know, they have savings and loan. They've got all kinds of stuff built into the SIM card. And they also have like bonga points, which are 
kind of like loyalty programs. And so they're, they're really experimenting with uh, currencies as well. And so that, that's another potential option is, you know, can, um, you know, like for us, we would love it if they would add our menu, you know, like they could, they could add us onto their menu and we would automatically be on every SIM card in the country already. And they could, you know, that cost is really nothing to them. So, I mean, that's kind of a, a dream in a way as if they would, if they would help like that, but it's, I think it's slightly possible. Um, and, and I like that, you know, if we're going into an area like, um, you know, in Bogota and Colombia, well, fine, in Bogota, everyone's got a smartphone or, you know, lots of people do anyways. Um, maybe it would be, be fine to just use it on a web app. So I, I'm kind of just leaning towards, you know, okay, if we have to use USSD, fine for now. If there's some other good options, like you guys have just mentioned, that's cool too. But just having a basic web app that allows people to do these, Mm -hmm. um, and then we deal with that problem, you know, like internet connectivity yes. and whatnot. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that you, you have to to have an uh, like a, a mix solution because, as you said, like you cannot like even setting up your own network is a lot of work. We, you know, even setting up like an access point. We did that on the slums in Buenos Aires. Like we we bought them an access point, and it's a process. So I think you need to to use like different models and different things and in any, you know, incentivize in the direction, in the more optimal direction, but not force it like a single solution because you have to adapt to whatever the people have. Like what you were saying is like, if they have a feature phone, let's find a solution to use with a feature phone, even though it's more centralized or they don't own the keys, but you are giving accessibility. So they should be all built around the user needs. And then, you know, increase decentralization, you know, efficiency, uh, but, but not force like a one solution for the end user. Exactly. I was thinking also like uh, in the past, we did some experiences with um, electronic like uh, cards like that work off chain. So they are less secure because they are not synchronized with the network. But, you know, as they are pretty high tech somehow, it's difficult that people will tamper them for small amounts. So that's also an alternative, like uh, cards where you can transfer value. Uh, our chief security officer built, uh, Sergio Lerner built some designs for that. So um, I think maybe I, I need to go as well, but maybe, I don't know if there is a document with all the pain points because with that in mind, and, and now that I understand the context, I can work with our teams to see how we can, uh, on the IOE Labs, uh, how we can help on the technology side and maybe find solutions for the different pain points. We're working on that. That's oh, okay. Am amazing. Exactly. So we already told <laughs> actually going on this direction. Oh, amazing. Well, I, I need to go, but thank you very much. I, I love uh, the project and I love, you know, it's like, very inspiring as well, like somebody saying on the chat. <laughs> so I, I, I'll stay in touch. Take care. Thank you, Diego. Bye bye. Well, this has been uh, great. Um, Adria is here. I know that, uh, and Bertrand, I mean, we are, we're recruiting people who can help us. Oh. And I know you guys will have that, <laughs> that heart beating really fast and telling her, you know, yes, I want to be part of this. So please come. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I am able, available, so no problem, so. Yes, we have Adria in. We need to add him in the channel. Bertrand? Yes, also. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, will, I think I have not joined yet the Telegram group, uh, but uh, I've thought to, to, to join it. Um, I was thinking, do you have any opinion of, uh, about a good dollar uh, for the UBI? Uh, you, is, it, is it something that uh, you have considered as a project? I mean, uh, you have studied already? Uh, yeah. uh, because I thought it could be also a way to, have, uh, to use blockchain for humanity. Yeah, I, I think you know we've talked about using good dollar as as another one of these kind of reserves. Um, you know, so the idea that you know it doesn't have to be die, right? So if a community is is being created and they want to use good dollar as a reserve currency and 